Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us, everyone. Um, we had 716 people register, 322 were medical professionals, and we have people from 30 countries and the top country being the US. So I'd like to introduce to you um, Dr. Sam Lebsock, um, pharmacist Michelle Moser, pharmacist Stephen Dixon. So thank you very much for joining us. We're going to go round in alphabetical order, starting with Michelle. Uh, Michelle for, is from Makers Pharmacy in Washington State. Thank you for joining us, Michelle. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Would you tell people your experience of LDM, please? So I've been a pharmacist for 35 years and really started looking at low-dose naltrexone probably, oh, maybe 10, 15 years ago through a colleague. And really over the last probably five or six years has been my, my deep dive into what low-dose naltrexone can provide for patients. And we have a wide variety of patients that we see on a regular basis. And we also do a lot of follow-up with them. So I'm able to glean a wide variety of studies and, uh, and certainly a ton of stories. And really the, the stories are just, they just really touch your heart on how this medication, which is you know low dose, low risk, and has such a tremendous benefit. And um, that has been, mm, just a very exciting part of being a pharmacist in low-dose naltrexone. Well, thank you. So, and then we have um, Dr. Sam Lebsock, who is from Belmar Pharmacy. Would you like to share your experience, Sam? Sure. <clears throat> so I've been working with LDN for about eight years now out of Belmar. Um, we see all different types of dosing and ranges. Um, we love, I love LDN because I feel like it's something that like Michelle was saying, we get good results. It's very easy for the patient, very cost effective for the patient. And that's like really what we're looking for. So I do, the stories are great. And the, the results, there's nothing that's beating the results right now, I think. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And next we have pharmacist Stephen Dixon from Dixon's Chemist in Glasgow in Scotland. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. That's good to be here. So I've been working with Linda in the LDN Research Trust, uh, dispensing LDN probably, I think we said 17 years-ish, I think. Yes. Yeah, probably. So very much echoing what everybody else is saying, that um, there really is nothing else that does what LDN can do. Um, I'm always amazed uh, that people do so well who have previously failed on everything else. Um, so, I mean, we treat patients for everything from MS, which is the standard indication, to right way through to working with oncologists and very very complicated regimen with uh, you know using a, a consultant on top oncologist looking at the brain tumors and all sorts of things it's really every day is a bit different and often involves uh, reading multiple papers so <laughs> yes yeah, good fun so um, certainly uh, it, it's a place i don't ever uh, get bored working in the LDN department that's for sure okay thank you so if you would all like to ask your questions you can ask them for a specific speaker, or if it's a general question, just leave it blank. But if you want somebody to um, answer the question, put their name first, then type the question. Okay, so we'll start with you, Michelle, if you would <coughs> like to start at the top. Sure, absolutely. So we have um, a, a caller who would like to know about LDN and pregnancy. Looks like they are currently on a 4.5 milligram dose and trying to conceive. Looks like she's a fairly busy individual. She lists a few medications that she's currently taking, specifically levothyroxine, bupropion, um, Vibrid, and Allegra plus vitamins. And the question is whether or not she could stop some of those medications and only take LDN if that would help in pregnancy. She a uh, uh, little bit further down specifically says that she has already asked a pharmacist and a gynecologist, but they weren't very sure of the answers. So how I would approach this is I, I think it's very important to really understand the breadth of a low functioning thyroid condition. I think it's important to not just look at TSH, 
but also look at some of the other lab parameters. And that's going to give us a lot of information, especially if you're trying to conceive. So we need to look at the free T3, free T4. Uh, we need to look at TPO, which is one of the antibodies, and perhaps thyroglobulin as well. And I also like to look at a reverse T3, which indicates how stressful a situation is because that cortisol can actually allow for that uh, active molecule, which is lyothyronine, to be kind of flipped around and then it becomes inactive. So that's really important to understand all the pieces of the puzzle. What we find not only in case study, but also in scientific papers is that low dose naltrexone is incredibly helpful in a low functioning thyroid situation. When we start low dose naltrexone, we still need to monitor what's actually happening with the thyroid labs because they can significantly change even as quickly as four to six weeks after starting LDN. And why that's important is because we don't want someone who is currently on therapy to all of a sudden become hyper or um, hyperthyroid or even have too much medication, particularly when you're trying to conceive, because there is a very narrow window where you have enough medication and yet not too much medication to be able to not only maintain your own metabolism, but certainly then allow for conception and then also maintaining a good viable pregnancy. And we know that Dr. Philip Boyle has done a lot of research and he's spoken on the use of low dose naltrexone in pregnancy with tremendous success. So we know that there's very few side effects, very few drug interactions, and we know that low dose naltrexone does help with allergic issues as well. So if that's the reason why she's particularly taking um, Allegra, which is an antihistamine, um, if there are some other issues going on, LDN could potentially be helpful as well with um, specifically depression. So I think that that hopefully answers the majority of the question. And um, if not, please let us know and we'll answer a little bit more. <laughs> Right. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, Sam, you're next. Sure. So the next question is, can LDN help with migraines? The answer is yes. I have seen this time and time again out of the pharmacy. Um, yes, it can help with migraines. Any type of inflammation, which a lot of times does happen um, with migraines. Um, a lot of patients have reported decreased migraines once they get on a maintenance dose of LDN. So yes, I do think it's worth a try. And We've had a lot of su success with it. Thank you. Okay, Stephen. We can't hear you, Stephen. Okay, so we have a patient who is asking if we can tell them what the benefits of LDN are for MS. So um, it's certainly something we've got plenty of experience with. Um, as the help Linda would maybe be better answering this question, actually having been uh, in that position herself. Um, but being one of the, uh, Googling this will give you uh, so many different people's stories and perspectives in MS, especially looking at the LDN Research Trust website. Um, benefits can be anything from just feeling a little bit better to improve bladder, bladder control, to um, improvements in pain, improvements in plasticity. And, uh, but generally it's all coming from this uh, overall anti-inflammatory effect that you get from taking LDN. So because MS is, MS is such a kind of range of symptoms, I can't really say, well, one thing is going to be different because everyone is very different. So it's, with MS, it's really a case of try it and then take a, a very careful note of how you are feeling over a period of four to eight weeks and then see what has and has not improved. And most people, the majority of people, definitely get some sort of benefit in one or more symptoms, if not all. And the very minority of the ones who do not seem to get any improvement at all. Mm -hmm. Exactly that, because I mean, you can have, you know, one of like 40 different symptoms when you've got MS and people usually only have a few, but everybody, as you say, is different. Everybody has a different range of symptoms. And it also depends on how long you've had MS, you know, how bad your MS is etc etc but if they go on to the LDN Research Trust website and do a search condition data for MS there is hundreds of videos there are conference presentations 
there's all your mechanism of actions and there's an awful lot of information there for people to uh, check out. So thank you. We, we could talk about that for an hour. <laughs> yes, you could <laughs> quite easily. <laughs> yes. So um, Michelle, would you like to go again? So another attendee wants to know, is it a common side effect for TSH to rise when starting LDN? Apparently it's happened twice in the year and a half since starting LDN. So there, are, there could be a, quite a few things going on. First of all, I don't see it as a common side effect of directly between LDN causing TSH to rise. So TSH, when TSH goes up, that means thyroid function is going down. So there could be wide variety of issues going on. It could be, is the medication that is being used to treat the low functioning thyroid, is it, uh, has it changed? Is it still being taken on an empty stomach? Are there other things going on in the gastrointestinal tract that is potentially decreasing the effectiveness or the absorption of the thyroid medication? So I don't see it as a direct correlation between LDN and the rise of TSH. Sometimes TSH goes up when we have other underlying conditions that are affecting thyroid function that are blooming or potentially gastrointestinal changes. So there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation between taking LDN and TSH going up. Otherwise it would happen all the time. But I, I think there's some underlying issues that probably need to be addressed and um, that can certainly be done offline. Okay, thank you. Okay, Sam. Um, this question is, any experience with treating vertigo with LDN or any side effects of dizziness while on LDN? Um, I will say yes, dizziness is a side effect of LDN. I see it sometimes when a patient maybe starts too high of a dose or maybe they haven't fully tapered. I, I do see dizziness a lot of times reported. What I normally tell that patient is maybe they need to go back down to their dose and stay on that lower dose a little bit longer before um, tapering up. So yes, that is a side effect. Um, generally, it's, you might just need a longer taper rather than a week. Maybe you need two weeks, maybe you need 30 days. Um, it kind of varies from there. Okay, thank you. Stephen. So uh, the next so the next question that we have is a patient asking about the use of LDN with traumatic brain injury. Um, so there, this is someone who's either had a concussion or a stroke or something physical to happen to the brain. So, I mean, there's quite a lot of information on this available. And in fact, there was a conference, I think the last conference, Dr. Sarah uh, Zistar did a most amazing presentation on this. I couldn't possibly hope to touch in two minutes, but she was very clear and explained it very well. But what I do remember is that last year there was actually a paper published in PubMed that was trying to find, showing that um, in the animal model, naltrexone was neuroprotective against traumatic brain injury in animals, in animal study. So that was actually published properly last year. So I think the answer to that is yes, but would very much depend upon the condition and, and the individual situation. Um, you wouldn't want to give the LDN instead of an anti-plaque agent or an anti-stroke agent when someone's had a stroke, but then if you've got someone who's suffering with symptoms post-concussion for a long time, as Sarah has said in the past, it wouldn't be a bad idea to use it. Um, I think if the person is asking that um, wants more information, just have a quick look again. On, I think I might be saying this a lot <laughs> on the LDN Research Trust website to the, to the presentation which um, Sarah uh, did last time. Thank you. Okay, Michelle. Have we heard positive results of using LDN to treat idiopathic peripheral neuropathy? Yes. And, and I think you're going to hear that a lot is yes. And mainly because when we're dealing with uh, peripheral neuropathy, we're generally treating an inflammatory process. And so low dose naltrexone is excellent in helping reduce inflammation, not just centrally, but also peripherally. So we see that a lot with 
uh, application with mm. other medications. So the use of low dose naltrexone with other medications, not necessarily as a monotherapy, but I think no matter where you're at, anywhere in the world, a low dose naltrexone would be uh, potentially beneficial in helping with peripheral neuropathy. Okay, thank you. So Sam. Is LDN good for treating insomnia? So yes, I do have um, providers who like to use this part of the sleep regimen. I would say that here, the main mechanism is that a lot of times patients who have trouble sleeping is because there's some underlying um, issue going on, whether that be autoimmune, whether that be some type of pain, inflammation. So if we can get that under control with LDN, then a lot of times these patients end up sleeping better. And so they have better results and they think like, oh my gosh, my sleep is salt. But in reality, we may have like gotten their inflammation under control and now they're sleeping like a baby. So yes, in, um, LDN is very helpful for insomnia and sleep issues. And we see it used quite frequently. And a lot of times these patients, once they're on a maintenance dose, will report it's the best sleep they've ever had. Thank you. Stephen. So this is a question from a patient who's asking if it is good to cycle LDN. Um, I've been taking 4.5 milligrams to help with remission. I'm assuming that's from cancer. Um, should I take a break periodically? Also, is a sublingual version better assimilated? Thank you, um, patient. So there's a bit of confusion, and I guess there might be a bit of dissension among the pharmacists who are here about uh, breaks in LDN. Um, there was a conference a number of years ago where one of the oncologists spoke about pulsing dosing between LDN and cannabinoids. And it, that caused a bit of confusion because we all thought, oh, we need to stop LDN for a week to take cannabinoids. But in the conference that then happened the year after, um, Professor Dobleish uh, clarified that in the studies that they looked at whether it's uh, cancer cell growth, LDN was already pulsed because it was such a period of the day where you were not being exposed to naltrexone because it was clear from the body. So the pulsing was really more to do about taking cannabinoids in a pulsed way rather than the LDN. So you're already cycling on and off of LDN every day by having a gap. Um, regarding the sublingual version, better assimilated, uh, generally in most people not, but if you have leaky gut or you have absorption problems or you're unable to swallow uh, tablets properly, then a sublingual version is probably as well, if not better absorbed, than the other forms. Um, but from, a, from an empirical point of view or from a, a patient perspective, the sublingual form that we use, we only really use it where patients have had problems with the other formulations. But because in theory it uh, bypasses first past metabolism, it may help with um, drug interactions or problems they're having with stomach cramps or any of the side effects that people have in the bio. So that's why we do that. Thank you. Okay, Michelle. So the next question kind of tags on to what Dr. Sam was saying just a few minutes ago. Very interested in LDN for sleep, getting to sleep and staying asleep. So to just piggyback on what Dr. Sam was saying just a few minutes ago, LDN can be very helpful for sleep. When people report that they're having vivid dreams, then we know that LDN is actually working, that it's actually getting into those, uh, allowing someone to get into REM sleep, which is restorative. And then we know it, it works pretty well. So when people have a hard time getting to sleep and staying asleep, Sometimes there's other mechanisms or other issues going on. And so we maybe need to look at what's going on with magnesium or melatonin, vitamin D. I mean, there's a wide variety of issues, but even if someone is um, kind of wired, but tired because their cortisol is up and uh, that's affecting their ability to kind of turn it off at night so that they can get to sleep, that is something that LDN can help with but it may not necessarily be the only product that we wanna take a look at. And that's the beauty of low dose naltrexone is that we can start at little tiny doses and slowly work up to find that individual's very happy dose and then kind of take it from there. Okay, thank you. So Sam. Um, this patient has had mono, um, had mono over 20 years ago. She has high Epstein-Barr virus titer, um, is still high. Um, she has chronic 
chronic fatigue syndrome, and she's wondering if LDN can help in lowering these antibodies levels and if it can potentially help ease her chronic fatigue symptoms. Yes, um, chronic fatigue syndrome has been, has widely have, I got to think of the right words. Um, LDN with chronic fatigue syndrome has been documented pretty well. I think it's all over the LDN Research Trust website. So yes, this is a very good treatment option um, for these type of patients. Um, will it help lower your antibodies? Yes, there's probably a little bit more to your story. I think I would need to know about your Epstein-Barr titer. Um, so we might have to take that offline a little bit because there could be some underlying other things going on there that I think we might need to understand. But as far as antibodies decreasing, yes, LDN will help with that. And with chronic fatigue, it's been shown to have great, um, great results there. Thank you. Okay, Stephen. So this is a patient asking about using LDN to treat constipation or slow motility and asking what doses work well and what time do you tend to dose the LDN? So I have to say that I personally have no experience at all of using LDN to treat constipation. Um, it's something which we just have not come across um, in the last sort of 15, 17 years. Um, in theory, I guess if it was caused by taking opiates, then yes, but if anybody else wants to take that, um, it would be more than grateful. I will say that I found that LDN is kind of a pro-kinetic um, agent, so it can cause some diarrhea. Some patients do report that as a symptom initially, um, so I have seen that. Um, and yet, to also then roll into the next question, which is, what are the main side effects you find when working with LDN? It's interesting and not to confuse this point at all, but LDN can also bind to the opiate receptors in the gut, which can actually slow the gut, right? So sometimes you might have a little bit of constipation, but I think the most or the most widely reported side effect is vivid dreams. Um, and that can be, that can be minimized. It may not be negated, but it could definitely be minimized by really slowing that taper. And they gen generally that goes away in a, in a few days. But I will say that for some people, that's very dramatic. That can be literally the difference between being able to work or not being able to work or even care for their family. So whether we're dealing with um, sleep disturbances, sometimes a little bit of a headache. Um, some people classify that as a migraine, but we usually mm -hmm. just say headache. And then uh, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, GI issues. Those are pretty much, there's always going to be these one-offs, right? There's always going to be some other things. But I will say the majority of the time when we're following up with patients, you know, around two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, et cetera, the side effects that they're talking about aren't necessarily specifically because of LDN. It's more of understanding their underlying issues that we're using LDN to treat. So whether somebody has Epstein-Barr, well, if you have a bloom, there's a, you know, for example, there was a, a wonderful naturopath from Arizona that spoke on sometimes you feel worse before you get better. Mm -hmm. Well, people classify that as, as a side effect. Well, that isn't, that isn't because of low dose naltrexone. That's because of the underlying disease. So it's really about understanding that and then keeping in touch with your medical professionals so that they can help hold your hand and walk you through that so that you don't inadvertently bail out on LDN before it's really reached its full potential. Okay. Stephen? Oh, I think it's me. Um, oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, this patient is talking about L LDN and RA, um, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and yes, rheumatoid ar arthritis is fabulous to treat with LDN. It is a great cost-effective treatment that you just can, that the research shows. I will say that a lot of rheumatologists, I feel like are kind of coming around. If you, if you present them, you know, these these trials or, you know, these case studies, a lot of them are willing to try. Um, you can find all this on the LDN Research Trust website and it's really great and patients are seeing amazing results and it's 100% worth a try. Thank you. Okay, now it's Stephen. 
So this is a patient who's saying that they have taken LDN 4.5 milligrams daily for several years because they have microscopic colitis and didn't want to take steroids. And they don't currently have any symptoms and they've been avoiding gluten and dairy. And they're wondering whether or not after a few years they should stop taking LDN and see what happens. So I guess that's a really interesting question which comes up for us really quite often. How long should I take LDN for? Um, and there isn't really a standard answer for it that, that we find. We sort of say, well, do you know, my first go-to place is if you were doing well and nothing else worked, why would you, why would you put yourself at risk of being unwell again? But then also you don't want to take something every day if you no longer need it. So, I mean, if you're going to say, if, if normally if someone wants to take a break, we'd say, well, make sure you've got enough to restart and take a two week break and just monitor your symptoms. And I'm, I'm guessing that's probably very similar to everyone else in the group. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, uh, but then again, it's one of those things I would say that's on a very individual basis. If you have been doing really, really well with something much more severe, um, then maybe you would want to think twice about stopping LD and sort of control things. I would just add that I have a lot of patients who stop it and then three months later, they're calling back for their refill because they've had a flare. That's very, very common. Thank you. Michelle. So the next question is, are there particular things to know about using LDN for the following issues? Muscle pain, inflammation, and autoimmune uh, related issues. So really what we're talking about is inflammation because whether we have muscle pain, that's usually due to an inflammatory response. And low dose naltrexone has been shown and proven in, in wide variety of scientific studies and papers that are published all over the world that low dose naltrexone specifically works to reduce inflammation everywhere in the body. So if the muscle pain is due to overuse or a lack of nutrients, low dose naltrexone is going to help reduce inflammation, but isn't necessarily going to help relax that muscle fiber, such as what magnesium would do, right? Because magnesium is a natural muscle relaxer. However, when we're dealing with autoimmune issues, which I think is probably the majority of the patients that we see on a regular basis using low dose naltrexone, most of the time there are side effects such as, or general symptoms of muscle pain and um, a wide variety of inflammation. And that is absolutely what LDN is, is very, very good at. And again, because there's so few side effects and there are so few drug interactions, it's definitely worth a shot. It's not very expensive and it's always low dose. And the beauty of low dose naltrexone is that if it's working, fabulous. If you don't think it's working, you can, you know, with the advice of your medical provider, as you can simply stop and see what happens. That's where, you know, not only Stephen and Sam have alluded to, but a lot of times people pick up the phone and they're like, oh my gosh, I did not realize how well LDN was working until I stopped. And I think we even heard that from Dr. Weinstock, Dr. Zielsdorf in a wide variety of other uh, physicians who have presented in the previous LDN seminar. Thank you. Okay, Sam. Um, the next question is about thoughts on LDN being covered by insurance. Um, I will say that I bet you can find a better price, a cash pay price um, versus insurance because it's a compounded medication and most insurance companies aren't contracted with compounding pharmacies. So you could probably find a cash pay price of between, you know, 60 to $80 for a three month supply. So that, that's what I would kind of say about that. Most insurance companies probably don't cover compounded medications. Thanks. Okay, Stephen. So this is a patient who um, has Hashimoto's and is on levothyroxin and lymphoma. Uh, they're on LDN, but they still get quite bad highs and occasional angioedema on their lip. They're asking whether or not they should persist with LDN or any thoughts on those. Uh, I think this is far too complicated a question to go into in, a, in this sort of forum. There's multiple things that we would have to talk about there. 
Is your Hashimoto's being properly monitored? What's the dose of thyroxine? Are you getting myothionine? Um, you know, what, where, what are you taking for the highs? Has it improved the LDN? There's so many things there that, um, that you need to. So I think you should maybe get in touch directly with the LDN Research Trust in writing so that one of us can come back to you in more detail later on. Okay, thank you. Michelle? Can LDN worsen hyperthyroid? So um, a thyroid that is working um, overtime, so to speak, can LDN make that worse? Well, I think we need to get to, again, the underlying issue. And, and is this a situation where it's an autoimmune hyperthyroidism, such as Graves' disease? And I think Dr. Zielsdorf was very eloquent in describing what potentially could be some of the issues around hyperthyroidism that sometimes people kind of ebb and flow with their, their thyroid issue where they could be high and low. Now, what we do know is that if someone is on medication for thyroid replacement, then we, we need to take a look at thyroid markers, you know, what is going on with their labs after they've been on um, low dose naltrexone for a while. So anytime we have either a high functioning or a low functioning thyroid, I mean, that is the major metabolic pathway of the entire body. We always have to monitor and how quickly or how often we monitor. That is something that again, is very individualized. Yes, it has happened, but again, with, with good lab results, I think it can be very easily handled. And it's, I don't think it's necessarily a situation where you should stop your LDN. Okay, Sam? All right, this is a patient asking about LDN in psoriasis. Um, so this patient wants to know about taking LDN orally for psoriasis, or they've also curious about LDN topically with um, psoriasis. And so in this situation, I would say if the psoriasis is all over your body, I think it's best to take orally. Um, there is some good research on taking LDN topically. I would say it does work best for like a pruritus situation, if there's like an itch or something like that. But with psoriasis, I would probably suggest the oral formulation. I don't know if Stephen and Michelle want to chime in here about topically, I mean, you would just have to apply topically all over your body. And so I think it's probably easiest to take that orally and you'd get the better results. We're actually working with a consultant dermatologist in Scotland mm. who's doing a kind of mini trial on this. Mm. Um, his latest results, I think were something about 70% of patients taking oral LDN responded for, for um, urticaria and uh, chronic problems for antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers hadn't worked. Um, but he tried cream in some patients and really didn't get very much response in plaque psoriasis. Or, you know, so I think it's probably an absorption issue rather than mm -hmm. an efficacy issue. And specifically, this patient says about um, using uh, 4.5 already in Aquaphor, and that's an ointment base which is going to be greasy, gooey, and it's going to change absorption. And I don't think you're going to get very good absorption there. And a lot of times when we're dealing with psoriatic plaques, you know, a lot of times they want to use an ointment base, but we have found that there's such, there's better bases that we can use specifically for, for a dermatological application, whether we're using it for urticaria or a lichen or, you know, specifically hives. It, I think it has everything to do with the base, but I completely agree it's not a replace, topical is not a replacement of oral. Thank you. Okay. So the next question is, um, what is the best filler to use if you have colitis? Also, will LDN eye drops help recurrent corneal erosion abrasion syndrome? So basically my, our opinion would be anything that's not lactose. Pretty much. Uh, I'm getting some nods from the other pharmacists, so just avoid the lactose for a filler. Um, pretty much anything else that we're going to use is going to be fine. Um, regarding LDN eye drops, uh, that hits me quite hard because we can't get them in the UK and we can't manufacture them. So maybe someone else could answer that question for me. 
So, do, um, so Michelle or Sam, do you guys? We, we don't do eye drops either, but I there are is some good research using LDN yeah. eye drops, especially for a different type of eye pain. Um, th there is some good research out there at a really low um, dose. I don't know it off the top of my head. So I actually have personal experience of this because my own father was having terrible trouble having had a cataract. Uh, taken out and he ends up with abrasion and exactly this, this erosion and abrasion around the site and uh, we managed to get him onto some oral LDN and um, while he didn't really tolerate the LDN very well everywhere else, his eyes were fixed within days. <laughs> <laughs> so, Amazing. Well yeah but he came off of the LDN after about six weeks and his eyes have never they, still remained fine so I mean, that's, that's been quite good so I've been desperate to try and get LD eye drops but the sterile facilities in the UK are almost impossible right um, to get them so yeah. Sebastian Dennison talked quite a bit in a in mm. one of the extra uh parts or one of the extra presentations to the seminar this last June specifically on LDN eye drops and, and it's a very fascinating fascinating use of low dose naltrexone but again, it's a, a topical application that I, it doesn't replace oral. I think it's a great addition, but not necessarily, you know, it's not going to be a total replacement. Thank you. Okay, Sam, or is it Michelle? Um, so the next oh, question is LDN and depression. Oh, that's a big topic. And I will say we often hear that People who are using low dose naltrexone for other conditions, whether they're autoimmune or um, viral infection, often find that it actually helps with their depression and it helps with their anxiety. It helps not only lift their mood, but it also gives them energy, which is fabulous. And that doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen quite a bit. When in, in my professional experience with LDN and depression, we usually start at very small doses. So not necessarily low dose, but very low dose. And we might go down to a hundred micrograms or even 50 micrograms and start moving up that way. The actual mechanism, I'm not really sure just, you know, decisively what that is, but we have had greater success using 0.1 milligram and slowly working up versus starting at 0.5 or even one milligram. So it's um, it's an interesting concept, but we have seen it work very well. Okay, the next question is a patient who has GI issues, bad acid reflux, um, certain areas that are discomfort all the time. They also take probiotics. Um, so, and they also have, it sounds like some back pain. And so they're asking, can LDN help with gut inflammation? And the answer is yes. Um, it's been very successful in Crohn's patients, any type of GI, depending on how severe, um, like Stephen was saying, you may need to do a sublingual um, tablet. Usually oral's fine um, with the absorption, but yes, it does help with gut inflammation. Um, it helps tight junctions. It's fabulous for that. Thank you. So the next question is, um, are there any prescriptions that boost or inhibit with the human metabolism of LDN? And the answer to that really is not really. Um, basically, pretty much most medications are suitable with LDN if you speak to your pharmacist and your prescriber correctly and work out how to do it with the, the obvious option of not taking strong opiates, painkillers uh, that are long acting. So there's not really usually too many barriers to taking LDN with our medication. Um, so, but it is very much, as a very wide question, talk about that for several hours. But from a metabolism point of view, not really, there's not really anything else you could take that would cause a huge difference in the elimination. And the next attendee would like to know, are there any contraindications to low-dose naltrexone? So there are some significant issues that we need to avoid, which could be classified as a contraindication. So we don't want to use opiates or synthetic opiates within, you know, four to six hours of low-dose naltrexone because naltrexone is going to bind those same, those same receptors and it's not going to work. So 
We also need to be very careful if we're using biologics. So if someone has the, let's say, psoriatic arthritis, or if they have the need for a biologic, and they were just recently started on biologics. We've heard from other physician presenters at LDN conference and also in quite a bit of literature that we need to be careful about the timing of low-dose naltrexone. But it does seem that if you're on low-dose naltrexone and then start a biologic, that's a different reaction than if you're on a biologic and then start LDN. So whether those are classified as true contraindications, I'm gonna defer because I don't see those as true contraindications, but at the same time, we just have to be sensitive to what's going on. So if someone is having a scheduled surgery, we usually ask them to stop their LDN 48 to 72 hours prior to their need for surgery. And then LDN can simply be picked back up if they're you know, soon after the surgery, as long as they're not using opiate or synthetic opiate-like medications for pain control. Okay, thank you. I have a question here that has been sent in by a lady uh, who wasn't able to attend. I was just trying to read it. Um, she says, um, the question I had hoped to ask was about split dosing versus single dosing. It seems that there's so much information about advantages and disadvantages. What concerns me is the healing is important long term. And though the split high dosing I've settled on after much adjusting and experimenting is five milligrams in the morning and five milligrams at night. It's ex excellent for inflammation, pain and mood. I really wanted to know that it's good for healing long term. Should she be taking split dosing or um, single dose? Who would want to answer that one? I, <clears throat> I guess. I would say it depends on the patient and what we're exactly treating. Um, for I see split dosing a lot of times more beneficial for more type of mood, um, anxiety, depression type of, of disorders. I see better results on daily dosing with autoimmune types of situations. Um, pain can also benefit from twice daily dosing, um, but more autoimmune I see a once daily dosing. Um, but like I said, it kind of depends on the patient and what we're fully treating. Um, I do think it is important, especially in autoimmune, to have that release. It does bind to the receptors for six hours, and you do kind of need that release. So sometimes with multiple times dosing, you don't get that um, release of the naltrexone from the receptors. But Michelle, Stephen, feel free to jump in there. Well, and I have to agree because with autoimmune, twice a day dosing, not as beneficial. Um, I have seen... And, and I believe um, Dr. Forster and Dr. Lannis talked about this um, at the 2019 conference, I think it was, mm -hmm. where they were actually using it for de significant depression up to three or four times a day. But again, those individuals were incredibly closely monitored and those were taken individual case by case situations. So this isn't general. Um, anytime that you dose, more than twice a day, you're almost in a sustained reaction, right? So mm -hmm. you lose that intermittent blockade of the receptors, which is so important to how LDN actually works. So um, I, but I have seen uh, fibromyalgia, for example, is a very difficult disease state to treat. It doesn't matter what you're using, right? It's just very difficult to treat. And how quickly somebody responds is also very individual. So we have started using uh, twice a day dosing, but we're using a little dose, smaller dose on one end of the day and a little bit bigger at the other end of the day. And that's where our liquids tend to be very easy to use because it's simply just the measurement, whereas you don't have to then mm -hmm. you know, have a huge stockpile of half milligram capsules. And, and then wash it down with, you know, ton of water. <laughs> so again, very, very individualized. Twice a day dosing isn't for everybody, but when we're dealing with weight loss, right? Then we're usually in twice a day dosing mm -hmm. as well. Um, but where do we stop with the term low dose? So I, I can maybe add a little bit in there. So our, our experience was not really that similar to that because we had patients, there was a fad, oh, and how long, 
must be about 10, 10, 12 years ago, where one of the prescribing doctors uh, started moving people with Crohn's disease to twice daily dosing. Linda, you'll probably remember that as well. There was quite a lot of questions about it then. Yes. And his, so what we really have found now is that people who we would, we would have moved on to twice daily dosing as a trial, we move them to sublingual dosing instead, and that seems to get the same result. Mm. Um, so I think before going to twice do daily dosing, I would go to sublingual dosing first. Just okay, um, thank you. But I do know uh, we have one volunteer who's got fibromyalgia. And she found that a single dose didn't really do anything. A double dose, she was like, wow. And then she thought, I'll experiment doing it three times a day. And she got even better results. So I don't know. It's all. Um, it's very patient. And it is, patient isn't it? Specific. Yes, exactly. So thank you. Um, for answering that question for this lady who's going to watch the recording. She couldn't be here with us today. So who was next? Sam. Um, I can go. So this one is talking about LD does LDN help with COVID vaccine related joint pains and inflammation? Also long, um, long COVID. So I think this is interesting. I, I think this is actually being studied at the University of Michigan, but correct me if I'm wrong. I think they have a COVID um, naltrexone study, LDN study going on. And I don't have the results of that because I, I know it's ongoing, but it makes sense um, with how LDN works that it will help with COVID long haul. So um, mechanistically, yes, I do think it makes sense. It will help with um, joint pains and inflammation because it decreases inflammation by blocking that toll-like receptor four, and it stops all those excitatory cytokines. So yes, it makes sense that it will help with um, long COVID and even with any type of COVID related vaccine issues. Okay, thank you. Stephen. So the next question is asking if there is any indication for LDN preventing or slowing the, prevent, the progression of Parkinson's disease. So this is something which uh, we get this question probably every second to third day. And I'm always a bit disappointed answering it in that the standard answer we give is there is no evidence that it slows the progression of Parkinson's, but it certainly makes you feel better. Um, and that was backed up by a number of studies that have been done over the last few years. It improves mood, potentially improves the general feeling of well-being, but doesn't seem to do anything to the progression of the disease at this point. Okay, thank you. Short and sweet, sorry. Yep. <laughs> Michelle. What is the lowest and the highest doses of LDN that have been used and found beneficial and for what uses? Oh boy, this could literally be, we could be here for days. Um, so in the interest of time, I will say that ultra low dose, which is um, a few micrograms has been studied. Uh, that was the oxytrol um, study. And that has been used to actually help people get off of their opiates. And that in our pharmacy, we have had tremendous success with that. We had a lady who was on um, hydrocodone with acetaminophen for more than 15 years. And within 45 days, we had her, she was very motivated. Okay, so, so within 45 days, she was completely off. And with that, we found that she actually had some other issues. So then we slowly increased her dose from there. So I would say from just a couple of micrograms, one to five micrograms up to, um, very low dose, which is usually around 50 to 100 micrograms, we can actually see for a wide variety of uses, including chronic inflammation and pain, even with a, a mood uh, variability there. If we're dealing with 0.5 milligram to 4.5 milligram, we will see those that used for the entire spectrum, right? So whether we're dealing with autoimmune, GI issues, Crohn's ulcerative colitis, um, a wide variety of other inflammatory situations. And then when we move above, let's say 4.5 milligram, and now we're dealing with 8, 16, 32 milligrams, now we're into the weight loss categories. So low dose naltrexone can be used for a lot of things. What I will say, and this has been brought up by many presenters at the LDN conferences, and it's, we've also seen it in the research, 
is that when you start escalating the doses, you start losing some of the benefits associated with low dose because naltrexone is a very interesting molecule. Um, I've been a pharmacist for 35 years, and this literally is the most fascinating product that I've, I've come across in all my time. LDN works very differently at low doses than it does at higher doses. It works mechanistically almost, well, I don't want to say opposite, but just very differently. And so we have to identify what we're going to be using it for. But again, because it's low dose, low side effect, um, you know, low, low drug interaction, low cost. It's like, why not use it? Okay, thank you. Sam. Can healthy people take LDN for maintenance? Well, this is an interesting question. I mean, I don't want to promote people to take LDN for no reason at all. Um, but I will say, like, I have patients who take it for like weight loss, like Michelle was saying, or seasonal depression that we have patients who do it seasonally. Um, so yes, I do think in certain situations it is, um, it is beneficial. Um, and I do have a patient who take it for anti-aging reasons, um, but necessarily as a maintenance drug, potentially, I guess. I, I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? <laughs> So, so, so many people ask us about LDN for aging. Um, unfortunately, we are bound in the UK that we cannot prescribe or dispense for a known condition. Right. So, um, you have to have a condition first. <laughs> so, um, yes, I think you I phrase the questioning to your prescribing physician more correctly than I wanted for aging is my general advice if you want. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is I'm 81 and I'm hormone replacement therapy and they have low thyroid function and they take 25 micrograms of levothyroxine. Am I a candidate for LDN? I'm very healthy. So I think my question would be why do you want to take LDN? What, what is suboptimal about your life? And that would be something to take, again, not for an open forum, um, but anybody who has hypothyroid potentially can benefit from, from LDN as we spoke about earlier on. So, Certainly the answer is probably yes, um, but again, it's, a, it's an offline uh, question. Thank you. Has anyone reported the use of LDN to either increase low blood neutrophil numbers or lower high blood lymphocyte numbers? I don't recall a specific study looking at either of those situations. Um, that doesn't mean I've read everything though. So, I mean, I'm trying to remember anything in the Dartmouth study, you know, the, the compilation of the over 900 uh, papers that summarized all the wonderful uses of low dose naltrexone. I, I don't recall anything specific to this, although when we think about the mechanisms of how low dose naltrexone actually works on white blood cell changes, um, it could potentially help. I can jump into the link to a paper please. if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was a paper showing that in MS, uh, in the long term, it maintains a healthy neutral count. So I'll try and put that into the group uh, conversation. That would be great. I'd love to see that. This next question is a two-part question. Can you explain a bit, a bit more of the effects of LDN on the immune, immune system? How does it work? I also heard that it can help with sleep. I only started on LDN about two months ago and I am on it to help um, treat with chronic Lyme disease. Is there any good resources apart from the LDN Research Trust booklet um, that I already have to read more about LDN? So I'll start with that. Um, the LDN Research Trust also has the abstract of like every single paper that's ever been published on LDN, right, Linda? So that's a great place to start um, with, and you can find, go to their website and then you can even search indications and it'll pull up all these different abstracts on every, every paper they have on that indication. Also the LDN books 
are great resources. They have a chapter, they're right behind Michelle right there. Um, they have a chapter on all, each chapter is a different disease state. So they're, that's very helpful. And obviously any, most compounding pharmacies, Michelle, uh, Steve and myself, Linda, I'm sure gets tons of questions wrote into the LDN Research Trust. So we're always here to help. Um, as far as how does LDN work? Um, LDN is a um, opioid receptor antagonist, so it blocks the mu receptors, and that's um, it helps increase endorphins by blocking those. And then it also is a toll-like receptor for antagonists, so that is that inflammation pathway that I was talking about, how it blocks those inflammatory cytokines. So two types of thing there, inflammation and then um, the endorphins is what's thought to help boost the immune system by blocking that mu receptor. Steven can probably go more into this because he is way more detailed into the pharmacology. He's, he wrote the chapter actually in the LTN book. So I'll leave it to him if he wants to add anything else there. Well, I, I think you've done a really good job of summarizing. And if you want to know more, you should buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Available at many online stores. <laughs> Uh, my next question is, can LDN be incorporated into the WHO oral rehydration salt solution to calm inflammation in the GI tract? Um, it's a bit of an unusual question. Um, I think from a pharmacological point of view, there would be nothing to stop you putting LDN, to, LDN into oral rehydration salts. But I think that's a, there's a much wider question there, I'm guessing, um, that would to do with licensing and having to do a study, et cetera. So I think... From a one person, if you had someone who had inflammation in the GI tract and you wanted to give them oral rehydration salts, then yes, you could put LDN in without any problem. Okay, thank you. Now, I am trying desperately hard to remove and answer any duplicate questions. So I am here and I am listening, but I'm also reading as well. But if I have missed any questions that are duplicates as you come to them, please, um, move on to the next one. Thank you. All right. So that would be me. So the next question will be, oh, am I on mute? No. Okay. So the next question is, is LDN best taken on an empty stomach or in the morning? Um, well, most of the time, I think people are taking this at bedtime. So uh, and I think what we've realized is that when it is taken in the morning, um, can you guys hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So when it is taken in the morning, a lot of times it's rotated to the morning time because of, um, situations where it's disturbing the sleep too much. And then that, that could be where the benefit would be come in to take it in the morning whether it's taken on an empty stomach or not, I literally haven't seen any difference in that. Um, but most of the time, if you're taking it at bedtime, you're taking it on an empty stomach anyway, with just water. Thank you. Next question. Um, what would be the lower dose for vertigo be considered the starting dose is two? So if you're having vertigo or any type of unpleasant symptoms when you're on a dose, I would probably try to drop down to either one and a half, one milligram even. Some patients are pretty um, sensitive to medications and they might start at like 0.5. So don't, don't feel like you have to go up to this four and a half. I think it's important to note that a lot of patients don't get that high and they still receive a lot of benefit down at those lower doses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, can LDN assist in rebuilding bone density? Uh, the simple answer to that is yes. Um, there's quite a complicated mechanism by which it can work. It would take a little bit of time to explain, but what I'll do is I will post uh, an answer with a paper that talks about it in the answer. Okay, so my next question is, um, can LDN increase cortisol? I have high night cortisol, so I don't wanna increase it anymore. If it does, what would you recommend taking it? So the mechanisms by which cortisol are elevated have a lot to do with stress situations, but also 
even interaction between how the chemicals are moving in the brain, whether or not there's enough melatonin, some of the other substrates like vitamin D, but also even going back to the sex steroid hormones, right? So oral progesterone can increase nighttime cortisol if it's, if it's too high. There's a, a wide variety of things going on here. Directly LDN, I don't see increases nighttime cortisol. Uh, if anything, I think it helps to reduce the inflammatory responses due to elevated cortisol, whether it's direct or indirect, um, you can make a case for either of those, but when, but the question specifically was, does it increase cortisol? And I don't see that. I actually see that it helps with the benefits of high cortisol to, um, help reduce the inflammation due to elevated cortisol. So if it does, what time would you recommend taking it? I still recommend taking it at bedtime just because when the body's at rest, you tend to have more restorative sleep. You tend to have more, um, uh, opportunity for the endorphins to increase and just kind of go from there. Thank you. The next question, um, we have a 74 year old who was diagnosed with Hashimoto's at age 60. Um, she also has high blood pressure and is on um, levothyroxine and amlodipine. She's gained some weight um, and her blood pressure has gone up. And unless she can lose weight, her doctor wants to potentially add another blood pressure medication. Would LDN help her lose weight and um, lower her blood pressure? So I guess I would say here first that LDN will help with her Hashimoto's. And I think first we need to maybe get her Hashimoto's um, under control. Um, I would add LDN for the Hashimoto's right away. And then once you get your thyroid under control, that can help with weight. So like first let's fix what's going on with your thyroid. Then after we get your thyroid, you know, at a level pace, then we can talk about, you know, weight loss and then we can talk about your blood pressure. But I think you'll find if we get your thyroid under control that some of these other things will slowly resolve after that. Um, that's what I would say with that. That's kind of a loaded question. Yeah, because even though she was diagnosed at Hashimoto's at 60, you know, it didn't just pop up at 59 right. and a half, right? That's something she's been battling for a long time, would be my guess. The next question is, in the Netherlands, there is LDN cream. What is the indication to use the transdermal route? And this is from a gynecologist in the Netherlands. And in fairness, in the UK, we have almost no experience of LDN and in gynecology. Does anybody else have any experience of this? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, we had lichen sclerosis topically has been, um, it's great with LDN, I would say. We've had some success. It takes a while. It's, it's like a six month, you know, you really have to give it time to work, but we have seen results um, using um, lichen sclerosis. And then as far as, well, that would be a transdermal route, I guess. Anything else, Michelle, that you can think of? Well, you know, when we're treating uh, gynecological issues, that's a topical route, right? Whereas right. transdermal, we would use maybe for autism um, because that's actually going to drive it through the skin. So yes, we we do see, uh, especially for lichen, and um, even if there's some inflammatory other inflammatory issues going on, uh, we can definitely use low dose naltrexone. And then depending on the base that we put it in, we can actually use some muco adherent types of bases to help the medication stick there. So you don't have to use a lot, um, you know, half a milligram per gram, you know, 0.5%. Um, I mean, you, you just don't need a lot, which is really, really nice. And that's going to help not only with the irritation, but also help to reduce the autoimmune issues. Okay. Thank you. Who's next? Sam? Stephen. Stephen. Um, so how does one know what side effects may show when your LDN goes too great? So this is really interesting. Um, again, being involved really quite early on with LDN and MS, we saw that there was, in some people you sort of reach a ceiling. So that, that's why we, we started titration. Um, initially, um, when we started dosing patients with LDN, everyone just got 4.5 milligrams. Um, and then we realized that it worked for some people and didn't work for some people. 
and some people felt great and some people felt absolutely dreadful. So that's why we started using titration doses. So really it's when you can, you, you can tell yourself you hit the ceiling of feeling better and then suddenly you're feeling worse uh, and there's a way to find a dose in there somewhere. And that's a very personal journey for each person. Um, and it, it's, there's no one specific thing that I can say, that, oh, the side effect is you'll develop a terrible headache. That, that's not the case. It's just that the, your improvement suddenly just, just disappears and you get this mad ceiling. I, I'm told that you can't really, you can't really describe it until it's happened to you. Okay, Michelle. So this lovely lady um, comes in and she says, cortisol uh, peaks around 4 p.m., low normal 8 a.m. How to find out if my endorphin timing is also mucked up, how uh, or would they then peak at 2 a.m. trying to figure out when to take LDN? Uh, I think LDN dose at bedtime is always going to be the best place to start. I would start low and go slow. However, that is um, whatever that dosing is, whether you start at 0.5, one, one and a half, it again depends on that individual and exactly what are you using LDN for. Just because your cortisol is on this roller coaster ride, that may not be the real reason why you're taking LDN. There may be, there's obviously a lot of other things going on. So go, you know, start low, go slow, find where your happy dose is. You know, like Stephen had the previous question, sometimes you, you bump it up a dose and you don't feel as good as you did on a lower dose. So we, less is more. So I, that's what I would do is to figure that out. Now, how, how LDN actually works with the uh, HPA axis and how it actually works in the brain with those chemicals you're always going to have an increase in endorphins because it does, it will block those receptors, which will cause you to make your own endorphins, but that is different than cortisol. So I'm, I'm a little confused. I, I think we need more information on this question. Thank you. Sam. Um, what recommended starting dose would be to help with sleep? She has a lot of patients who, um, who can fall asleep, but they have trouble staying asleep and they wake up around two and then they can't fall asleep. Um, do you use it just at a certain amount of time? I guess for this situation, it depends on the patient. Um, some patients, I like to ask patients if they're sensitive to medication kind of right off the bat because some of them can maybe start at one and a half and some of them who tell you like, I'm very sensitive, but everything affects me. Then I obviously start those patients way lower, like 0 0.1, 0 0.5. And then I kind of taper from there. So I would say it really depends on each patient that you're treating. Some of them don't have any symptoms right away. Mm -hmm. And some of them have a ton of symptoms if you start LD. So it's very case independent. Um, generically, I would probably start them at a one or a one and a half milligram, depending on the patient, if they're a normal patient. Um, does it help with staying asleep? Yes, like I said earlier in the lecture, I think um, sleep is interesting because a lot of times there's underlying disease states there going on. And if you can control those, then the patient ends up sleeping better in the long run. So the next one is what pathology test do doctors use to monitor progress with LDN RX? This is a very, very wide question. <laughs> Depends on the condition that you're presenting with, there's an answer to that. Um, but basically the same test that you use to check for normal, like run results for like standard allopathic medicine can be used to monitor progress with LDN, as well as a number of other tests, um, which especially around about the thyroid, there are so many incredibly complicated and very intricate tests that can be done by people who are specialists and hormones that it is, this would take quite long to look at. So if you have a specific query, then email it through and we'll reply. So what about sleep issues due to anxiety and depression? Um, you know, we talk a lot about sleep, right? And it does help. When we're dealing with anxiety and depression, there's underlying issues. And I think that that is a common thread that we're hearing with a wide variety of these questions. There's always some underlying issues. So um, one thing that I remember the first time I ever heard Stephen speak, which was the beginning of a, I think it was the 2016 LDN conference, is that 
<clears throat> LDN doesn't cure anything, right? It just tricks the body into doing what it's supposed to do much more efficiently and effectively. So when we're dealing with anxiety and depression or any other condition that we're using low dose naltrexone for, we got to get to the root issue. So low dose naltrexone will definitely help to induce sleep, help to get into restorative sleep, help to decrease anxiety and depression because of um, its mechanisms by raising endorphins. However, it's not necessarily always used as a monotherapy, right? We don't necessarily use LDN by itself. We're usually using it with other medications or other supplements. And specifically with anxiety and depression, I go down to, you know, let's take a look at what's going on in the gut. Are they making GABA? Are they absorbing theanine? Are they utilizing theanine? Are there bacterium in the, in the GI tract that's inhibiting this, that, or the other thing, or, or even mm -hmm. eliciting some issues associated with anxiety and depression. So this is a, a multi-layered, a multi-layered <laughs> answer to this question. But again, low dose naltrexone can always be of benefit here. At least what we've seen in the science and case study is that we've seen it used effectively and um, very <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Next. Um, this, this next patient has been taking LDN 4.5 milligrams and has several different autoimmune disorders, and she's experiencing symptoms of an autoimmune disorder that she has not had for years, despite being on LDN, um, which was after a period of high stress. And she's been on six milligrams previously and wondering if she should increase her dose. So I will say that with LDN, um, potentially, there's obviously a lot going on there. Um, Normally, when you have one autoimmune disease, you have multiple autoimmune diseases. And so if you don't have the first autoimmune disease reined in, your body's just going to keep keep having issues. And so I don't think you're necessarily controlled. Um, I don't know exactly what your autoimmune issues are. It depends on what your indications are, I would say. But potentially, you may need to go up, but potentially, you may need to go um, down. I guess I would need to know a little bit more of your medical history to really answer that question, but it's not uncommon for patients with autoimmune disorders to have multiple disorders. Okay, thank you. The next question is a new symptom of shaky hand related to LDN overdose. Um, this again, you would need to know what the actual condition was to begin with before you started talking about it. In general, um, I think over the last sort of 15 years plus, I think I've seen three patients who, when they started LDN, had what are called extrapyramidal symptoms as a side effect. Uh, I don't know what anybody else has found, but in some people who are very dopaminergic, um, it would appear that whatever happens, for whatever reason, you can get these extrapyramidal symptoms that tend to go away. Um, in the past, they've, they've resolved by halving the dose and then starting to patient care. Well, I have to say that LDN doesn't help when you're choking on a glass of water. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. Oh, Do carry well, on. <laughs> does LDN do anything for active Epstein-Barr virus? I currently have MS. So the, uh, we've heard from Dr. Kent Holtorf, who has spoken um, very eloquently on the use of low-dose naltrexone in a wide variety of viral in infections. Um, we've, we've had several providers over the years speak on that. But I do remember uh, one of the naturopaths, again, from Phoenix, and I think our last name was Sherwood, if I remember right. The one thing that she talked about is when we're using low dose naltrexone in the situation of a viral infection that sometimes people get worse before they get better because the immune system literally works on everything 24 seven equally, right? So when you reduce inflammation, sometimes you can help get rid of a couple of the issues. So then you're actually concentrating the efforts of the immune system on those remaining problems. 
So, and, and also what we have found, especially with viral infection, is that when you reduce inflammation, you can actually cause other things to come to the surface and you can have a bloom, which means that you can feel worse before you feel better. So it does help in the long run, but sometimes you got to trudge through not feeling so great uh, in the short term to actually see the long-term benefit. And again, that's when we can bring in other therapies to help with the symptoms due to that, um, that bloom or due to that um, chronic infection. And I don't know about you guys, but here in Washington state, we have um, a lot of MS cases. I don't know if there's like a belt that goes across the world, but we have a very high rate of uh, MS diagnoses. And a lot of times we are seeing an underlying viral infection that is that is there as well. So the use of low-dose naltrexone has been very effective, but again, it's not a short-term use medication. You've, you've got to be in it to win it for the long haul. Next question is, is LDN good for prostate health? Um, I guess, you know, LDN is great for keeping the body's um, immune system in check, I guess you could say, um, but I would kind of need to know more about this patient. Like, do they have, you know, what's going on? Are they have prostate cancer or is something else going on? I guess I'm not sure. I don't know if I would just take it just to protect your prostate, I guess I would say. Is, does anyone else have any experience with this? Just there's a number of patients who use it, use it for prostate cancer with great results. Um, right. Um, so but with, for just health? Again, it goes back to the prevention <laughs> versus um, with treatment, doesn't it? Okay, move on to the next question. <clears throat> so could um, vivid dreams be considered part of the healing process of the consciousness that accompanies the physical shifts? So this is interesting that I've got this one because we have a very different perspective in the UK on vivid dreams versus the US, I think, or people in the group. Um, very early on, when we started treating people with LDN, we discovered that the vivid dreams were a very significant and frequent side effect. Uh, and in MS patients, we tended to really suggest starting taking LDN in the morning and not really looking at evening dosing unless they weren't getting any good results. So as generally as a kind of measure of safety, almost everyone in the UK that we deal with starts in the morning and would only really go to the evening if they weren't getting a good result with LDN. So I, it's one of those ones where I can understand the concept of the uh, the theoretical concept, but I think we saw it more as a side effect rather than a healing process. But maybe Michelle, you were talking about that earlier on as, a, as an important part. Let's yeah, see. and I was just reflecting on um, some of the previous seminar, LDN Research Trust seminar and conferences <laughs> where people have added, you know, providers have added um, their information. And, and again, it, it's, it's kind of like once a day dosing, twice a day dosing. We see a wide variety of opinion in different camps and how it works. So it, it goes back to treating that individual and really coming up with what's best for that individual. Because like you say, a lot of times if the vivid dreams are impacting their overall health, then there's no sense in keeping it at a bedtime dose. That doesn't make any sense at all. So moving it to the morning can be just as beneficial. And, and I think um, both Dr. Chopra talked about that even for pain control. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Weinstock certainly talked about that as well for GI issues. So the next question is, what information do you have regarding ADHD and LDN? Um, that, that goes back to Dr. Um, Jacqueline McCandless, right? I mean, she was using a, uh, LDN oh my gosh, uh, 90s, I think it was on, she did a, a study, maybe it was even in the 80s, where she did a small study um, on children specifically. And I, if I remember right, the children in that study were anywhere from ages 10 or 11 months until they were uh, about 12. And she used mainly transdermal LDN because again, we're using, these are children and children tend to metabolize LDN a little bit faster. So her dosing was different than what we ne necessarily always see in adults. 
And then Dr. Brian Udell expanded on that. And he's been using low dose naltrexone in children for a number of years. In fact, if I recall, when he was first approached to speak at an LDN conference, I don't think he realized that LDN was used in adults. But yes. he was like, wait a minute, what? You, you use this in big people too? And, <laughs> and he gets tremendous success. And he actually wrote a wonderful chapter in the first book, which is the blue one, about the use of low dose naltrexone in children, whether they're on the spectrum or with um, attention deficit. Thank you. Next question um, is how about um, psoriatic arthritis who is currently taking biologics to help manage it? Um, yes, I have patients who take biologics and LDN. I would say you do need to talk to your provider um, about this. There, there's, I guess, some different train of thought. Some providers don't like it, some providers do. So I would say, you know, try to present some some paper to your provider before you go there, but I do have patients who take biologics and LDN. Thank you. Stephen. Yeah, sorry, I'm just uh, I'm losing the um, train of thought here. Right, okay, that question's a duplicate. Okay, so um, I take 4.5 milligrams daily as a pounded capsule. I've heard there are many fillers out there making capsules, one of the best fillers. I think we covered that already, didn't we? So basically, any filler apart from lactose is, is what we would go to. So I'll maybe just jump to the next one. Um, have, you, have you found LDN helpful for people who have frequent histamine release? So again, it's a generalized anti-inflammatory, which stops the immune cascade at the TLR receptors, but also by causing a reduction in the overall inflammatory response by releasing endorphins. So absolutely, people who have things like mast cell activation syndrome, who have um, very severe allergies, even um, so, uh, the arthritis we're talking about, psoriatic stuff, um, rheumatoids, uh, where it's all about this autoimmunity, then absolutely LDN is helpful with it. Plenty of information published on that. And let's see. Does LDN affect estradiol patch prescription metabolism? I don't believe that is mm -hmm. even remotely related. Um, if, if you're asking about does LDN affect um, sex steroid hormone use and, and uh, production, that's a little bit different mechanism than just using a hormone replacement product. Now, LDN can change the, how the gut works. So, there might be a backdoor mechanism there, but nothing directly. Thank you. The next question we have is we have a patient who started taking LDN after having cancer um, and had a removal of his colon about five and a half years ago without having chemo. Um, he has not had a reoccurrence of the cancer and he wants to know if he should continue taking LDN indefinitely. And my answer is yes, I think. LDN after cancer is, is so smart because it definitely helps keep your immune system in check. So yes, I would continue taking LDN indefinitely. There's a lot of um, studies out there about cancer and LDN, um, a lot of great research out there, and they all continue taking it on mostly these patients. Okay, the next question is, about, is very similar. In fact, it's about using LDN in patient with B-cell lymphoma who's not responding to other prescription medications or even CAR cell, CAR T cell. So, I mean, basically you have a patient who's already tried everything. Um, you know, there is nothing to be lost by trying LDN. And in fact, that's where we see most patients who start with LDN is that they've tried everything and a good proportion of them do rather surprisingly well long-term. So yeah, moving on. Have you seen benefit with um, irritable bowel syndrome or irritable bowel disease? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Leonard Weinstock has done some amazing uh, research and case study on that, uh, more specifically on Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. But you know, let's face it, irritable bowel syndrome and irritable bowel disease is just a precursor. Now, uh, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis may have an autoimmune component to it, but you know, let it, it's pretty much six of one, half dozen of the other 
just in earlier stages. I think you still need to identify what's actually going on in the gut. So there's different types of testing that can help with that. And identifying that is only going to add to the success. But I think one of the common theories or the, the common thread that you're going to hear from all three of us is that low-dose naltrexone has such very little uh, risk to it that why not jump in? Because the beauty of it is that after a, a period of time, whatever that is defined for that individual, it can simply be stopped. Now the benefits of LDN will certainly stop. And so those symptoms may come roaring back, but um, you know, it's like, why not? Why not? Um, the next question is, does LDN, what does LDN do for restless leg syndrome? Um, this is, LDN is great for restless leg syndrome. Normally I see dose, a little bit lower doses, I would say. I normally see like two to two and a half milligrams for restless leg syndromes, but we have patients who re have great results with restless, restless legs, sleep through the night um, pretty quickly, I would say. Within two or three weeks, normally they report um, better side effects. So yes, I do think that's a great um, treatment for restless leg. Yeah, interestingly, um, Dr. Uh, Weinstock, I think, I think he did a presentation on that a couple of years ago. Um, yes. Just trying to find the link. Yeah, I, I, I found it. There we go. I'll post it in there for you. Uh, there we go. So the next one is, does LDN help with anxiety? Um, I think we could all agree that yes, the answer is yes. Um, and we've talked about that a little bit. It's going to depend upon the mechanisms behind your anxiety and what's causing that. Is it sleep? Is it depression? What's in the background? But generally, the answer would be yes, but you would have to be very careful initiating it properly under proper care and talking to your health professionals. What is the highest dose to still be called low dose naltrexone? Well, I think that there's probably a little bit debate about that, but I think anytime you get over six milligrams thereabouts, I think um, Dr. Paul Anderson talked about that at the 21 LDN Research Trust Conference. Um, he is using doses, and, and there's a few other providers as well that are using doses a little bit higher than 4.5, but I think once you start getting into double digits, then you're not really dealing with low-dose naltrexone, um, and I think that that was shown even way back in Dr. Bahari's time back in 1985 when he was doing some research is that specifically looking at 25 milligrams or even 12 and a half milligrams that the mechanism of action started changing. And so the lower we got, we got into better and in different mm -hmm. mechanisms to really work with not only the endorphin system, uh, but specifically to help reduce inflammation through um, the cytokines and toll like receptors. Thank you. Um, the next question, we have an elderly mother who is 90. She has suffered two strokes and is on a blood thinner and blood pressure medication. She also suffers from GERD and dry eye, and she has trouble with mobility and uses a walker and has trouble sleeping. Will LDN help? Well, <laughs> there's a lot going on there. Um, I do think that LDN can help. It does help with dry eye. It can help with GERD. It can help with sleep. Um, so with all of that considered on a high level answer, it would be yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Stephen? Uh, this might be one that I'm not very good at answering, which I think this was from a question earlier on about EBV. Mm. Um, this is probably some, I think this is a question that was asked earlier that someone's elaborated on. So um, I talked about EBV just a few minutes ago. And again, Dr. Yeah. Holtorf uh, did a fantastic mm -hmm. job with going over Epstein-Barr. And I believe there was another naturopath that did as well. Um, and in taking a look at, you know, it, it, me interpreting lab results and expanding on that is not necessarily my wheelhouse, right? That isn't necessarily my scope of practice. But um, what I will say is that, Low-dose naltrexone can be very beneficial when we're dealing with a underlying viral infection. Yes, there can be blooms. So sometimes your titers will go up before they'll come back down. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should stop LDN. It means that you just need to give it a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Stephen, do you wanna go again and try a different one? <laughs> 
Uh, I thought it was going to get to skip there. <laughs> so this is uh, my dad is a pacemaker, diabetes, high cholesterol, BP, arthritis, multiple surgeries for back, knees, shoulder, etc. He's always in pain. Hasn't slept over years. Anxious, pushes himself. Still working full time at seventy five. Seems afraid to stop being busy due to pain. Could LDN help and be safe to take? Well, the answer there is absolutely, of course. He has clearly got metabolic syndromes. He clearly has autoimmune stuff going on with all the joints. You know, LDN is absolutely the first thing to be looking at as long as he's not taking an awful lot of opiates. Um, so yes, definitely investigate it for your dad. So this is, um, I'm almost up to 0 0.25 milligrams. I've, I've got three viruses about two months after I started. One was COVID. What was the, was that just coincidence or could LDN lower my immune system? No, it's quite the opposite. Um, I'm also taking a histamine intolerance reactions, dizziness, IBS inflammatory responses. It seems when I raise my dose, I got a darn virus. Hmm. Right now I'm taking about a third of a 0.25 milligram. I don't know how you take a third of a 0 0.25 milligram capsule. I really hope you're not opening that up and trying to dissect that. Um, that's not accurate. Um, that's not accurate. Um, ask about liquids or ask about a, a smaller dose to be much more effective. Um, I don't know how you're going to chase 0.25 milligrams in a capsule whose vol or even a tablet, but especially a capsule whose volume could be 130 milligrams. I just don't know how that would work. Um, so I think that there could be some dosing here. It, it could very well be that if you are dividing your dose, you're literally not taking LDN for quite some time. And that may be leaving your, your immune system open and susceptible. But low dose naltrexone, we know, helps to modulate the immune system. It works very on very specific pathways. And if anything, we have seen that those individuals who have been on low dose naltrexone have a lower incidence of COVID infection and reaction. And there have been several, at least in the United States, there are several studies going on about using LDN and COVID um, and the potential for infection, the potential for um, duration as well as severity. So there's a wide variety of arms to those studies that are happening. Um, let's see, uh, starting October, this is the first of year and you've been out and about since 2019. Um, I, I think what needs to happen in this situation is because of IBS and because of the inflammatory responses, I think uh, it may be a good idea to find a different dosage form of low dose naltrexone and again, start at 0.25 milligram or even 0.1 milligram and then slowly increase from there. Perhaps your increased interval isn't every seven days. Perhaps it needs to be a little bit longer <coughs> and then working from there. Um, I, I just think that low dose naltrexone is incredibly helpful for histamine intolerance, you know, moving that TH1 to TH2. <laughs> Um, and that's where you're going to decrease the dizziness because of how it actually works in the ears with, um, the cochlea, um, and is perhaps your immune system is just not seeing the benefits of LDN because of, of, uh, breaking the dose up. Did I miss anything? Okay, next question. I'm not sure what this one is kind of relating, so I'm going to skip over this one. Um, uh, this, um, the weight loss one, do you want me to talk on that, Stephen, or are you moving that along? Um, I actually just sent them a really nice answer oh, in writing. Great. So it's just taking a minute to catch up. Just fine. No, it's okay. You're, you're too fast for me. Okay. What are... Um, so, okay, what, um, what are the thyroid and other markers that be, should be monitored on LDN? So um, I think the antibodies are very important. You should look at TSH, you should look at T4, you should look at T3, you should look at free T3. Um, so those are probably the most important thyroid panel tests, I guess I would look at with LDN. If you're starting LDN, and they, um, I would recheck labs six to eight weeks after you start LDN on a thyroid patient, specifically like a Hashimoto's patient. Okay, thank you. 
So the next one is any info on transfusion dependent autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, and would that be low dose or high dose LDN? I, I think uh, this is a, a question for probably one of the more primary care doctors. <laughs> And uh, not something we come up, come across in community pharmacy. So I think mm -hmm. it'd be overstepping to answer the question. Unless anyone else feels confident with this. Mm -mm. No. Okay. And does LDN help with adrenal fatigue at what dose? So um, LDN, absolutely, we see very frequently is used in people who have adrenal fatigue because it reduces the um, neuroinflammation, it seems to reduce the pain, it reduces the stress feelings and the anxiety that we talked about before, which all have impacts on the adrenal fatigue. So that seems to be quite cool. Um, so this next question is literally a question that I field many times a week, and I'm sure you all do as well, is there is a great need for well-controlled studies on the use of LDN for disease states on various or various symptoms rather than relying on very small studies and just anecdotal reports on LDN empirically, comments from the panel. Um, so what I try to refer to is, first of all, there is well over 900, 950 studies, including approximately about 20 to 30 that have been conducted even in the last three or four years, but there are well over 900 studies on the use of low-dose naltrexone in a wide variety of situations. My most favorite document that I hand out to providers, I refer to as the Dartmouth study. It literally is a summary of over 900 articles based on the conditions in which they were studied and the results, including the dosing and um, uh, the patient population that was used, the numbers, et cetera. That is my favorite because it's, an, it's a very nice, succinctly packaged summary of how LDN is used. So I've been a pharmacist for 35 years, and quite honestly, I have yet to find um, pretty much any other commercially available medication that has got over 900 papers written on it. So um, with the exception of maybe the uh, coronavirus vaccine, I think LDN is incredibly well studied and has been used not only in US population, but population across the globe very well. And we, what we consistently find is that the mechanism of actions are very succinctly described. What we also, and because most in, in, uh, diseases are inflammatory in nature, that's why it's applicable to so many different situations across, across the globe. Um, but um, I, I would say that there are some great case studies, but again, those are case studies, but there are also some very good scientific studies out there. We are happy to provide those. Linda, I'm not sure if the Dartmouth study is available on the website. I haven't looked for it quite honestly, but it's, it is available in PubMed. Um, I have it right behind me on the, um, on the shelf, but um, the author, the specific author names uh, escape me at the moment. All the research papers that we can find as they come along, we add them to the website and we put them under conditions as well. So <clears throat> they should be easily found. All right, um, next question. I am interested in how this is used for weight loss, dosing recommendations, and how long you can use it. So actually LDN is in the commercial product Contrave in the United States in combination with bupropion. And so you can use LDN, it's normally twice daily dosing, and we're talking probably eight milligrams twice a day. Um, that's very common for weight loss dosing. It's been known to help with cravings. It's been known to help, you know, stop that desire to eat basically. Um, and so it has been used and we have seen some success with weight loss. Thank you. So um, the next question is um, basically asking about the use of honokiol or hon honokiol. I don't know if that's how everyone's pronouncing it, uh, with LDN for um, oncology patients. Now, this is something we do see an awful lot. And we used to see using this particular supplement, which comes from Magnolia Bark, um, before we managed to convince most of the oncologists to prescribe metformin. 
because basically lonopiol is the sort of natural form of metformin, which is an mTOR inhibitor and reduces the um, the body the way the body works with um, with sugars. So actually, yes, one hundred percent LDN with with this particular like magnolia bark extract is great. But in reality, we would much prefer that you get a proper licensed medicine, which we know it is what it says it is, i.e. metformin. So. I think it was Dr. Khan who talked yeah. about it. In yeah, the, it was Akbar Khan. That's yeah. it was Akbar. Yeah. yeah. Um, have you used 5-HTP, B6, and SAMI with LDN, and do you see any issues with this combination for anxiety depression? Do you avoid St. John's work with LDN? Um, yes, 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 no. Um, yes, we have used 5-HTP, B6, SAMI with LDN. There's a wide variety of really good over-the-counter supplements that have a, a beautiful combination with that. We do not have to avoid St. John's wort with LDN. Thank you. Um, this question, let's see. Do you want me to answer the handshaking question? Um, I think we're gonna, Stephen's typing something in for that one. Next yeah, question. Um, I had a shoulder injury related to vaccine administration. Um, when flu vaccine was incorrectly deposited into the tendon rather than the muscle. In this case, it doesn't disperse properly due to the lack of va vascularization. Shortly after that, I started to experience widespread muscle pain. I'm thinking that's supposed to say pain and wondered if it was exaggerated um, system-wide immune response of having, um, can LDN help with this? Well, I think so. I think LDN can help with this. Um, I don't have any research to say, but I think it would be worth a try if there was some type of issue and you are having muscle pain. I think it could be worth a try, but I don't have any experience, I would say, in this type of situation. So the next question then is uh, neuropathic pain, question mark. So um, neuropathic pain, absolutely, LDN. If you've tried everything else, there is absolutely no reason not to try LDN. And in fact, there are lots of presentations on the LDN Research Trust website, especially by uh, Pranik Chopra about chronic regional pain syndrome, uh, which is one of the most difficult types of neuropathic pain to treat. Uh, it does seem to be very effective. Um, so yeah. And in the U.S. right now, low-dose naltrexone is in phase two trials um, regarding chronic regional pain syndrome. So there's, there's that as well. Um, how about ADHD in adult and at what doses? Um, absolutely. I mean, if it works in children, we why not use it in adults? Um, we would still use typical dosing that we would use for pretty much anything else. You could start anywhere from 0 0.5 to 1.5 slowly increase the dose and then top out at the maximum of 4.5 once a day. Not everybody gets to 4.5. Um, and again, that's where, you know, working very closely with your medical professionals is going to help you find your happy dose. Thank you. Uh, next question. How can LDN change how the gut works? Um, I think Michelle, I think MN is Michelle. Um, thank you. I guess I would add one thing here with how the gut works first, let's fix, the, fix their vitamin D because vitamin D regulates tight junctions. So if you're having gut issues, I think you need to make sure your vitamin D is accurately dosed. Um, and then LDN helps very much with the gut, all types of inflammation, um, if Michelle wants to chime in here, but it's been studied very well in the gut, um, Crohn's, IBS. But like I said, I think you need to regulate your tight junctions first. Yeah, and I think if you go back and you can either listen to Dr. Leonard Weinstock and even Dr. Zielsdorf go all the way back to the 20, well, Sarah wasn't at 2016, but, um, you know, way back, I mean, we have many hours of, of lecture on this, but also the book has some fantastic mm -hmm. chapters specifically on this and some great pictures as well. So um, I would say if you want specifics on that, there's the books and, um, or simply look at the website or go listen mm -hmm. to the conferences. And, and maybe that's 
you know, I'm not trying to be short or flip, but honestly, there's so much information there that it's very difficult for us to address all of the points that were very eloquently made by these by these physicians in this short period of time that we have today. Next question is, what dose would be good for IBS and IBD? And for those patients in biologicals for IBD, what is the timing between both? So I think we discussed this uh, a little bit earlier on, but really it's, it's very much a kind of suck it and see type, low and slow, see what works for you. If you get side effects from taking LDN with, uh, orally, then look at sublingual, and it really doesn't really matter about the biologics. It's just about your response mm -hmm. to that direct interaction. Uh, so the next question is, I've been taking LDN 4.5 milligram for osteoarthritis for about five years. I'm not sure how much it has helped. Do you have any information mm -hmm. on the use of LDN in this condition? So again, osteoarthritis tends to be an inflammatory response. It might have um, an autoimmune component, but it can be a lot of times a situation where there's a lot of overuse and that's where low dose naltrexone is going to help reduce inflammation. Um, if you don't think it's helped very much, um, what I wonder what would happen if you stopped taking the medication. Um, I think that that could be an abrupt realization of, oh my gosh, it's been working great. So the other thing that I want to um, address is that it's, I think it's really important that when people are started on low dose naltrexone or even counseled throughout their time is the expectation of how well LDN is going to work. So low dose naltrexone isn't necessarily going to take a hundred percent of your pain away immediately, or even within the short term. Right. So most of the time, the patient expectation is you get a prescription, you start taking it. It's going to take care of everything 100%. And that's not necessarily always the case because especially when we're dealing with an osteoarthritis, perhaps there's a food intolerance and yet you still keep eating that food. You're going to continue mm -hmm. to have that inflammatory response. So are you actually taking two steps forward and one step back every day or every hour or, you know, whatever it's, there's a lot of other issues that go along with that. So again, it's about working with your medical professionals that really understand low dose naltrexone so that we can guide you and help you on that journey. And, and I will say, and I'm sure that Sam and Steven do this as well. Every day when we talk to patients who have been taking low dose naltrexone, whether it's been for two weeks or 10 years, things come up, new things come up, new information comes forward. And we're like, that would have been fabulous to know um, way back <laughs> when. Um, because honestly, time is the one thing you never get back. And so we want you to feel the best that you can be every single day of your life. And when we get into the weeds, when we really get down to the root issues, why does somebody also all of a sudden have osteoarthritis? Are they gluten intolerant? Is there a food mm -hmm. like egg or corn? Um, perhaps it's dairy. Uh, what else is going on? Do they actually have an underlying virus? I don't know. But those are some of the tests that we can look at and we can quantify. We can look at what's growing in the gut. Perhaps that's a contributory um, situation. Because again, LDN doesn't cure anything it supports the body's natural mechanisms. And that's what's, to me, the most beautiful part about LDN. Um, next question, would LDN help with chronic sinus infections and a dental infection due to an implant rejection? Um, so I guess to say you'd have to remove the implants, I would say first, because if that's causing the infection, you're not, the infection's not going to go away until that's gone. Um, but yes, it does help with infections. Like Michelle was just saying, it helps keep the immune system in check. So that's, I would say first, you have to make deal with the infection and the implant first. <laughs> Thank you. So while your colleagues are answering a question, if the people who aren't answering questions could answer the question online, type the question, that would be good. <laughs> then we'll get through them all. Thank you.
I'm trying to do that. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the next question is really about when we should be worrying about LFTs, that's liver function tests with LDN. Um, so we have only ever referred anyone for an LFT when they're in end stage liver failure. Other than that, because of the doses, it's really irrelevant to most people. There really isn't a concern unless you're an end stage liver failure. Oh, I love the next question. Why are so many doctors uneducated regarding low dose naltrexone? Well, that is the $100,000 question. Um, the bottom line is it's not produced by big pharma, right? So it is, it's a medication that we compound. It's a medication, even though we've known about its mechanisms and its application for what, 40 years or so? I mean, we've been dealing, we've been using low dose naltrexone and Bahari had that epiphany back in 1985. But the reason is, is because we don't have so much attention out there because number one, it's an inexpensive medication. Number two, it's compounded. Um, we're, we're, that's why we're having seminars like this and why the research trust was founded when it was, um, you know, 20 plus years ago and how we've been trying to get the information out on a wide variety of format and thank God for social media and being able to zoom like this. I mean, Linda and Steven are, are joining us from the UK, which it's, it's late back there. I mean, I'm on the West coast of the U S and it's not even 3 PM, but I will say that, yes, a lot of doctors are, are not up on LDN and, and a lot of doctors are really down on what they're not up on, but that doesn't, that should not deter anybody. Right. So let us help you. Let us help provide resources for you. Use the research trust. There is no other place anywhere where you could go to one website and find so much information. And a lot of times, and I, it doesn't matter what medication we're talking about, and it certainly doesn't matter, uh, matter what indication we are trying to treat. If this is really important to you that you feel better and you've spent years feeling awful and you've been through many providers and you're still not getting anywhere, don't give up. There is hope. There is, there are so many ways to still get the answers that you need and the medications that you require. Don't give up. Let, let some of us help you. You know, there's a great Facebook page. There's great Instagram. There's immeasurable resources on the LDN Research Trust. Don't give up. You might have to do some education. Your doctor may look at you like a deer in the headlights, like they have no idea what you're talking about. Don't let that deter you. <clears throat> let that inspire you. Let that then carry you in so that you can find and provide information. And it may not be the first visit that you get what you want. It may be the third or fourth, but let us help you work. Let us help you do that. I, I, can I just jump in as well? I think it's Please. incredible. Like what you're saying there is so inspirational. Um, having been in a position where in the UK, we have only had GPs to go to, to get prescriptions for this for such a long time. Now that we have all the other professions prescribing, the number of LDN prescriptions has just gone through the roof because they're not being as stuck in their ways as you were sort of describing, or they're more open-minded to looking at like holistically at the patient. So it's certainly, when we start to get the likes of um, naturopaths, or we don't really have those, but um, nurses and pharmacists uh, prescribing, they're far more open to reading the studies and then making their own decision. Uh, and, and that has been a, a revelation in the last, you know, last three or four years of the difference. Between. And I know that that's not the case in all countries across the United States. I mean, Linda said that there's over 30 countries represented on this call. And, and, and I realized that not every, not every, well, not even every state in the United States is the same, right? So um, again, the LDN Research Trust.org website is a phenomenal resource. And like I said, there are over 900 published papers on LDN. I challenge anybody to find another commercially available medication that is that well studied. I, I just, I haven't seen it. I'd have to say there are a lot of MDs who are very disappointed 
with the tools they have to help people with chronic illness. Um, Jill Cattell was one who, who wrote her story in the, the first book, um, whereby they just feel helpless, you know, the medications they have. And when they then study functional medicine and find that there are so many other things and using LDN as well, um, Dr. Leonard Weinstock says that they're open-minded, big, big, big brained doctors who look into LDN, but there are um, some tra traditionally trained um, doctors who are prescribing LDN. It's not all functional medicine doctors. These are traditional doctors. Um, but it, again, it's word of mouth where saying Dr. Leonard Weinstock, using him as an example, he mixes and he talks to other doctors and he persuades these doctors to prescribe LDN and, and it snowballs, and maybe not as quick as we'd like it to be, but it is, you know, um, gathering momentum. So that's good. Thank you. Also, we have the LDN book three coming out later this year with new conditions. <laughs> That's fabulous news. That is absolutely fabulous news. And, and I will say that if it hadn't been for the research trust conferences in getting, you know, sometimes as many as 20, 30 providers on a stage throughout a few days, that in itself is, it's monumental. It, it's inspirational. It is, um, it, it provides so much hope for what's there. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the conferences are available free of charge to view. So go out to the website. You don't, and some of the conferences are two and a half days long. So you may not have a lot of time to sit down all at one time, but you know, it, it's definitely worth, worth a try. And then you know, the research trust continues to um, also move along the, the, not only the knowledge of low dose naltrexone, but also the application. I mean, you're looking at, um, you know, LDN master one, two, and three right here. And, and yet prior to June, we didn't have that opportunity to um, really study for that. And a lot of us do it on our own, but you know, sometimes when there's that carrot of a different certificate out there, it's really exciting. It's very exciting. And now we have so many more. <laughs> well, the LDM book three, the, um, we've just been asked what the contents is going to be. We've got an updated history in pharmacology. We've got drug resistant depression. We've got, um, the title has changed, but it is to do with the change of cells with viruses. So, for example, it talks about Epstein-Barr herpes, and, and of course, the big one, uh, COVID. Also uh, about longevity, um, mixed connective tissue disease, mold toxicity, um, the use of LDN in eye conditions, and Professor Angus Delgleish has written about uh, long COVID and COVID. And um, we've got a chapter on LDN cancer case studies, and that's really interesting. The um, testimonials from doctors who have prescribed LDN for cancer and some of the remarkable stories that they have got to share. So it's a really interesting book. <clears throat> lots of really good information and as always packed full of references <laughs> does anybody else have any questions before we wrap this up i would just like to say thank you very much to linda for organizing mm -hmm. this and uh, giving us the opportunity to take part in something amazing again thank you even though i've kept you up, <laughs> up late <laughs> okay well, that's this amazing thanks linda Thank you so, very much for the opportunity and and I just hope that um, everybody got their questions answered. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you again soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.